Hi, how's it going? This is Resin of Colloid for YouTube, Resin under slash of under slash Colloid for BitChute. I'm here to do my read-alongs for tonight for Dark Shadows. This is Remains of the Judgment, a Dark Shadows story, Chapter 2. The door opened seconds after he knocked. A man with white surfer wavy hair and a tan... Damn, I hate when my phone goes off and a tan sports coat and jeans greeted him. Mr. Reeve, Alan Reeve. Alan extended his hand. Yes, sir, nice to meet you. Dr. Shaw shook his hand firmly and opened the door, motioning for him to come inside. How was your trip? Do you like Collins Port, he asked. It's beautiful, lot of character. I would like to come back and visit someday. And my wife, with my wife, after she has the baby, Alan replied in a friendly tone as he gazed around the surprisingly normal-looking office. There was an old look oak wood desk with very little clutter on top, a bookcase to match, and, of course, a tacky brown leather therapy couch. The room smelled of lavender, scented candles. The air was a little drafty. Would you like something cold to drink, Mr. Reeve? I have Coke and Mellow Yellow. Pick your poison, Dr. Shaw offered. I'll take Mellow Yellow, sir. Thank you, Alan obliged. Well, let's get right down to the, the matter at hand. You've been suffering from nightmares and recurring visions for some time. Am I correct? he asked as he made his way from the mini fridge handing him the soda can alan nodded eight months that's a long time how does your wife feel about all this he asked as he sat across from alan at his desk alan related the story and the current state of his living arrangements i just want them to stop and i want my wife back as it occurred to you that when unnatural things like this happen, that maybe it's for a big purpose. Maybe there's a supernatural force at work that believes in you and has chosen you specifically for something special. Something that no one else in this world could do but you. Dr. Shaw stared at him intensely. I, uh, I just don't know right now. I don't know what's going on, and I just want this to stop, Alan answered. How did you even know about me? How did you get my address? Well, I'm a parapsychologist, and part of my work is to commune with spirits and supernatural beings. When they try to tell me something, Dr. Shaw reasoned, you can't deny their existence, Alan. You say you go to church, so you all, so you of all people should know that your Bible says there are beings and apparitions in the air that we can't see with our finite eyes. I believe that many of these spirits have something to say. My grandfather Sebastian Shaw helped predict a disaster that happened in 1970 at the Great House of Conwood, where in town I don't believe that his gift or my gift or of being medium is something that's passed down through blood, but I believe that some were chosen for this purpose on that note. Have you seen someone in your visions that leads the way to what you're seeing every night, sort of like a guide. Alan nodded. Yes, a dark-haired young woman. She is very beautiful. She doesn't speak, but with, she doesn't seem malevolent or vengeful. I actually feel at peace when I'm with her until we arrive at the house where everything takes place. I don't know her name, but she's dressed in 18th century clothing. Are you familiar with the term revenant? Dr. Shaw asked. Outside the movie, no, Alan. Kid it? Kid it? There are human beings who die in return, not like 
as in reincarnated, returned, or zombies, or anything like that. But, I mean, they have been documented, or sorry, there have been documented cases of these spectacle human beings who die and wake up in other times that are, they are usually sent to prevent disasters, to help out with situations that the people involved cannot handle themselves. They retain all memories of time periods they live in, but in the moment of their deaths, they find themselves awake in another time and place. Dr. Shaw rose to his feet and pulled a chair next to Alan, who was sitting in the on the couch. However, such a drastic transition as death wears the body and soul down. Each time they transition, they become weaker until their final form is spirit, and they must rely on chosen they chosen someone or sorry choosing someone else to carry on their last will oh, goodness. Alan looked confused so you think this dark haired girl is a revenant you think she's chosen me to stop something perhaps I don't know the specific purpose I do believe that this girl's is a revenant and has chosen you to do something that was important to her. I also believe these shrooms won't stop until you find out what that is. Dr. Shaw looked at Alan compassionately. I'm very sorry to have to tell you that, but that's just the way it is. No medication, no medical doctor, no experiments, no nothing except getting in touch with this girl will help you. Alan, this is something you are going to have to face. Okay, okay. Let's assume I believe this. Alan stood up and started pacing the floor. How do I contact her? She can't speak in my dreams. I don't believe in seances or any of that other stuff. This is crazy. I have a plan, Mr. Reeve, Dr. Shaw replied calmly. I have a technique where you will be put under hypnosis for myself as a conduit. I believe she will be able to communicate to you the process is harmless and is actually quite refreshing. You'll be calm and relaxed and you'll be asleep. I'll be speaking with you as you lie there and we will, we will be talking just like we are now. It's my belief that in your conscious state, this girl will try to contact you with my help. You should be able to communicate in some form. Are you willing to try? <clears throat> Alan hesitated, still pacing and thinking. If I say no, then these visions will continue. All you need to do and think of it this way is to hear the woman out whoever she try however she tries to communicate with you you'll be safe here and unharmed after you speak or communicate with her then you can make your decisions on what to do alan what to do sorry alan motioned his hand to the couch how about we try with a deep sigh, Alan made his way to the couch and reclined his head against the headrest. I can't believe I'm doing this. Dr. Shaw reminded him, there's something special about you that this woman sees, Alan. She believes that only you can help her. Try and see it from her point of view. So what do I do then? Alan asked. I want you to... Close your eyes and relax. Dr. Shaw opened his desk and pulled a small metronome from the drawer. Take a deep breath and let it out slowly. The metronome stated, started ticking. Concentrate on your breathing, Alan. With each breath, you will feel more and more relaxed. Imagine a white light surrounding your body, 
floating through you. Sorry, floating. <clears throat> as long as you're in this light, you are safe and calm. Dr. Shaw's voice began to trail into a distant echo. Now, as I count backwards from ten to one, you will ease more deeply into a relaxed state of mind. Ten, nine, concentrate on your breathing, getting deeper and deeper. Eight, seven, six. Dr. Shaw began speaking more softly, but his tone was more commanding. You will enter a safe place inside the light surrounding you as long as you are the... In this sight, nothing can harm you. Five, four, three. Alan felt himself drifting off into a deep slumber. Yet he could see himself in in darkness, surrounded by a light circling around him. If at any time you want to return, all you have to do is open your eyes. Two, one. Dr. Shaw's voice faded into the void. As the haze of a dream began to materialize in front of him, still surrounded by light, Alan's body felt weightless. Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, weightless. And he could begin to see moving images of what looked like a colonial town forming in front of him. Could you hear me, Alan? An echoing voice spoke. Yes, I can see things. I see a town, an old colonial town. Alan sleepily replied, Oh, God, it's so strong. I feel strong sensations of deja vu. It's so strong. That's good. Tell me what you're seeing. Nothing here can harm you. You're only watching moving pictures, Dr. Shaw spoke gently. Wait, who are you? I know you, Alan replied. Who do you see, Alan? Dr. Shaw asked. Alan's brows tense as he was strained to focus. You, you're the woman I've been seeing in my dream. I know you. Hello, Victoria. Through the haze, Alan saw the outline and now familiar form of a woman he had seen guiding him through the, each dream when he... <clears throat> So, through the haze, Alan saw the outline and now familiar form of the woman he had seen guiding him through trips. Sorry. When he looked around, he was surrounded by a quiet evening sky resting above a quaint colonial setting. The woman whom he recognized as Victoria looked at him somewhat bewildered. The circle of light still shone around him. You can hear me, she spoke. Yes, Alan replied, I am... I'm Alan Reeve. I'm not quite sure what's going on or where we are. This is awkward to say, but I've had a dream about you every night for the last eight months. You show me horrible things happening to this little blonde-haired girl. Why? What am I doing here? Victoria looked at him with urgency. It's Laura. I've got to find Laura. She's not safe. They're coming. Wait, Victoria. Alan reached out as she ran off down the roads into the darkness. Meanwhile, Dr. Shaw was furiously scrambling on his notepad, n noting his words and facial expressions. Dr. Shaw, Alan looked above as if speaking directly to God. I'm here, Alan. There's no need to shout. I can hear all, always hear you perfectly. I'm right where I was before you fell asleep. Shaw gently reminded him. Can I move? Am I stuck in place inside this light? He asked, looking around himself. I need to follow her. You can, but once you step outside, you'll go deeper into your subconscious mind, and I will be further away. You might find it much more difficult to make your way back. You can't change the past. Remember, you're only seeing moving pictures. So what do I do, Alan asked, his tone growing worried. The two of you are linked. She's sharing her memories with you, Doctor, with you, Dr. Shaw suggested. Try thinking about Victoria. Concentrate hard.
Keep thinking about your dreams you've been having. Think about something. The house, the little blonde girl. Something. Let her connect with you. Help you find her. Okay, Alan, exile deeply the house. I'll think about the house. Very good, Alan. Concentrate. Think hard. Dr. Shaw directed him. Imagine the area surrounding what you, you saw leading up to this town. Alan began focusing on the night sky above. He looked at the stars and clouds passing by the moon, a chill began to creep down his back make and make him shiver. I feel cold. You're doing fine, Alan, Dr. Shaw praised. What do you see? Alan shifted his gaze downward to the ground, and the scenery had changed on the deep was the outskirts of the town, and what he assumed was possible. Colin's support, there was a house in the distance off to itself tucked inside a wooded area he felt himself mo mo sorry, motivating forward inside the light circle i'm moving i'm going toward the house it's slow alan felt himself being drawn closer and closer to the house drifting inside the light above the pin cones and autumn leaves the house he had seen so many times waves now coming into full view it was like a small cottage <clears throat> the cottage was very simple and quaint and was a single story high despite slight outside disarray it looked quite cozy the small set of stairs leading up to the front door was splintered and chipped in places moss was scattered across the rooftop and hanging off in places but the roof was intact there were no plants or flowers or any type of decorations outside to welcome visitors alan moved toward the tiny square of a porch and forced his gaze inside there wasn't much he could see as far as the interior except for a lantern lighting sitting on a wooden dining table shedding a trace among of light in the room inside he could see a fireplace and cooking split hanging above the logs while a with a quick glance, he caught a glimpse of Victoria inside. She was sitting at the table with a blonde-haired girl, little girl, maybe six or seven years old. He guessed they looked like they were doing schoolwork. Was Victoria a teacher, a tutor? I was her governess. A woman's voice so sounded behind him. Victoria, now a transparent specter, was making her way toward him. You can hear me, Victoria. Alan reached out. Please don't run away again. I want to help you. What do you need me to do? Time stood still, and everything that was moving come to a sudden stop. Victoria sadly looked down and looked inside the window. I was Laura's governess. I came to work for the Stockbridge family. I was here for almost a year. Her father was away a lot, and her mother was Victoria Paws looking frightened. It's okay, you can talk to me. You don't have to be scared. Alan tried to reassure her. Her father, Arthur Starkbridge, was a missionary to colonies in the South. He met Laura's mother many years ago and married her. He was always hard-pressed to help so many children in need, but Victoria's eyes matched his. He often, but then, ahead of his own daughter, he always wore his bleeding heart on his sleeve. Arthur did so much for so many children and helped so many people, but he was too devoted to his work. I tried speaking to him many times because Laura talked so much of how she missed him. He argued that Laura had her mother and me, and that was more than most children had. He was very kind to Laura and spent time with her when he was home, but 
that was the hard part. He would only stay a couple of days at the most and be gone again for six or to eight weeks. Alan interrupted. I'm sorry, Victoria. You don't seem to talk like someone from this time. You speak a lot more like someone from my time. I haven't been alive in many. I have been alive in many different times. I don't know how to how to explain it. I was born in 1948. I grew up in a family home until I was 18. I came to work for a Col the Collins family in, in 1966 and stayed there working as a governess for the youngest child living in, on the estate. Since then, I have died and returned twice in different time periods. Each time, there was a purpose I had to fulfill. Victoria moved in front of him. Until this time, my purpose was always to protect the Collins family. Now I am drawn to this little girl, Laura. How did you meet her, Alan asked. Victoria turned <coughs> her gaze toward him before I tell you. It's important that you believe what I tell you. Will you listen to me no matter how incredible it sounds? Of course, my suspicion or disbelief has already been pushed past its limits. By being here at all, I am. Your, I'm sure your story won't change that. Alan reassured her. I knew Laura in 1966. She was the mother of the Collins child. I taught. Victoria looked away to miss his reaction. My friend Frank Gardner and I discovered a dark secret that Laura wasn't what she seemed to be. When she returned to Collinsport after being warned. Through visions by the spirit of a woman named Josette Collins, who was well known to appear to people to the great house, Frank and I were able to research and find that Laura had lived several centuries before she would die and return once every century. When I found myself here during this time and I learned that Laura was here, I had no choice. I had to help her if I could. She dies and returns in other times like you, Alan questioned. Not like me, but I am in, but in some ways very much the same. I am a revenant, someone whose death is cheated by nature by some unexplained reason. And to reconcile events from different time periods, each time I die, my body and soul grow weaker. And that is left of me now as my spirit my body was murdered here right here in this house you are my last hope mr reeve you have to help me save laura victoria pleaded i'll help you okay alan nodded you've got to explain to me some things you owe me that first why me why are you haunting my dreams don't you realize that you have nearly broken my marriage my wife is pregnant with her baby and the strain this has put on me has been too much for her. She left our home and is living with her parents out of state. Victoria looked as she was about to cry. I am so sorry. I really am. I don't I didn't want to break up your family. There's so much that you will find out if you can help me, Mr. Reed. I'm trying to help. You save your family. Your situation is more serious and tied to this than you realize. I'm trying to help Laura and you. Alan grew frustrated. Really, how does this have anything to do with me? Are you trying to frighten me into doing what you want? Victoria stood directly in front of him. Please, you must help me. You're going to have to trust me. I'm trying to save you just as much as Laura. I am saving all my strength to help you both. I've not got much time of energy before I'm gone. Please, please help me, Alan. You're the only one who can do this. Alan turned away, tempted to take Dr. Shaw's advice to exit out of this subconscious, thinking deeply about what she said and knowing he didn't have the heart to turn her down. He sighed deeply and faced her. Okay, I'll help you. What do you need me to do? What is this secret about Laura? She looks like a normal little girl to me. Victoria's eyes grew fierce. She was at first, but 
Have you ever heard the story of the phoenix? The story about the bird who died and was reborn? I'm kind of familiar, Alan answered. Is this like what happened to you? <clears throat> it's something much worse, Victoria looked into the window, speaking as if she was remembering something that had happened. All nature seems to have determined what happens to me at the moment of my death. There is a wicked, evil spirit that mimics this phenomenon. There is an evil group of cult members who worship the demon. It is born through a female host and grows into adulthood. As the body begins to start to physically die in around age 25, she begins searching for a mate to give her a child. This demon requires the sacrifice of its host child to have the power to resurrect in the next century. A child? Are you talking about Laura? Is she supposed to be sacrificed? Alan asked. No, she's going to become the first phoenix, the next phoenix. When, when the mother gives birth to a male child, she lures at the moment of her death. And she and her son are burned to death. The act of sacrifice is necessary for the demon to res. <clears throat> Sorry. To resurrect drawing power from the child's soul. Victoria paused for. F females, it is much worse. They are subject to unspeakable torture and pain to become the next vessel for the demon to inhabit. So Laura's mother is this demon. Alan began pe piecing together what Victoria was telling him. She had us all fooled, Victoria said, turning her head from the window back to Alan's eyes. She is the most evil and cruel mother I have ever seen. I often thought for years about how I felt empty without ever knowing my mother. I was angry and for many years abandoned me at the foundling home. Victoria shook her head. That all seems so meaningless now. I can't stop the past though. These are all moving pictures and scenes from your memory. Sometimes I feel like somehow they're mine too. The, this all seems very really familiar but maybe that's the link we have, Alan reasoned. You can do more than you realize, Alan. As long as you're an observer, you can't change anything if you want to help. I believe you know what you have to do, Victoria Challenge. You have to let go of the training wheels. You can't stay where you are in your little circle any, and make any kind of difference. Alan looked up. Dr. Shaw, Victoria frowned at him, disappointment. She wants me to leave the circle. What do I do? Alan asked in a frantic tone. Alan, you can't, Dr. Shaw warned. You might go beyond where I can bring you back. You're safe where you are. Remember, you can't change the past, no matter what she tells you. Victoria's transparent hand reached for his. Please, Alan, don't do this. I need you. You need my help. Let's go, go together. Alan looked at Victoria and then upwards again to focus on Dr. trying to make his smile. I can't help you or call you back home if you step out, Alan. Dr. Shaw's tone grew tense as he pleaded. I won't be able to reach you. Open your eyes, Alan. It's too dangerous. Come back. Alan felt his soul being torn in the two. He knew his heart told him to do and the thought of Victor trying to help him and his family and this little girl seemed so dependent on him if I live to regret this what if something happens to Julie or the baby and it's my fault what if I follow her and I never come back I'll never see Julie again Victoria reached her hand and began to try and grab his please I need you Alan, wake up. You have to wake up, Alan. Dr. Shaw's echoing voice was booming inside his ears. While a deep breath, Alan closed his eyes.
Alan closed his eyes with all his the strength and courage he could gather. He stepped outside of the light circle and cased around him. He turned and saw it vanish behind him. With Dr. Shaw's voice following suit fading into nothingness, Alan now stood completely alone in front of Victoria, trapped inside this vision. So that is chapter two. Uh, or sorry, yeah. Oh, I, yeah, chapter, <laughs> chapter two, three, uh, goodness. So, <clears throat> I love the, the sequence between the parapsychologists, Dr. Shaw and Alan. Sorry. But I will say that Laura's story, Laura's story is interesting when I first read this, I was not expecting any of it, but going back through this, I'm pleasantly pleased with how Mark was able to take you back with and use a familiar character in Victoria, but at the same time, use a lot of new characters. You have Dr. Shaw, you have Alan, you have, you know... And this all seems to connect to Alan and his future that this is something he has to fix or else. And I like how we're getting the backstory of Laura, the legend of the Phoenix. It's really, really interesting. Guys, link is going to be in the description box. I hope you uh, enjoy this. Like, share, comment, and subscribe.